Hello all, thanks for joining this webinar live today or to those who are watching back on our YouTube channel. My name's Emily Owen, I'm a senior engineer here at Arup and I'll be delivering today's topic of model quality checks, getting your model right. I shall be describing some practices and considerations of checking your model, both pre-submission and when interrogating the validity of the results of your LS Diner analysis. And for this, I'll be using the OASIS software suite and I'll showcase how this can be used to help you with these checks. Before we jump in though, I wanted to start the session by considering what do we actually mean by model quality and checks? Well, model quality and associated checking can be construed in many different ways, and it encompasses all aspects of the LS Dyna workflow. So during pre-processing, this will be when you're generating the mesh, you're doing the model setup and definition, defining load cases, boundary conditions, contacts, etc. Then we run the model using the LS Dyna solver before post-processing the results where we'll visually review the behavior as well as interrogating the XY data. And at each stage of this, we can consider quality and perform different checks to ensure that we have our models right. So firstly, considering some of the pre-analysis checks, this would be things like the mesh quality, running error checks performed by your preprocessor of choice, looking at things like your part definitions and contact definitions, are they set up correctly? Is everything in your model attached correctly with the various connection types? And other things like what's the time step in your model? How will this affect the added mass? Is this acceptable? Then once you've submitted the model, you'll be checking has it initialized? If it has, are there any warnings? What's the time step and the implications on the added mass? And perhaps if it's an implicit analysis, you want to be checking, is it converging correctly? And finally, once it's hopefully normally terminated, you'll be looking at has your model produced the results that you're expecting and are they realistic? So this would be checked by looking at things like the XY data outputs, things like the energy balance and force responses. You'd also be visually checking the response behavior. Is everything attached? Is it the response what you were expecting? Looking at things like, is there a tolerable amount of added mass if there is any in your model? And you could even consider quality in things like the efficiency of the runtime. And obviously, if your model didn't normally terminate, then you'd be going back into the kind of pre-processing and assessing why that was the case. Now, of course, this list here isn't exhaustive. There are many more. But in general, these are some of the fundamentals in response to the question of what do we mean by model quality and some of the checks. So during today, we'll touch on some of these and I'll demonstrate in a little bit more detail how to perform the checks and also how the functionality of the OASIS software supports this. Before we do though, I think it's important to consider why is model checking and quality important? Well, the outputs from your model are only as good as the inputs. I'm sure you have all have heard the phrase, if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out in an FE analysis. So it's therefore important that as an engineer, you have robust methods for checking your models, both interactively and as part of a process. This is particularly true as LS Dyna models continue to increase in size and complexity. So consistency in checking your models is crucial. However, relying on the preprocessor and checks alone are often not enough. And of course, your engineering experience and knowledge must also be used to determine if a model is right and healthy. Are the results realistic to what you expect? But of course, experience varies from engineer to engineer. So it is important to have common processes in place for checking to ensure that it leads to consistent confidence in your model results. OK, so let's start with looking at some pre-analysis checks in more detail. So first and foremost would be your mesh related checks. It's the first step in setting up 
your LS liner analysis. And this would be things like looking at the element quality, so the warpage, aspect ratio, internal angles, for example. And often these are checked against your in-house targets. You might have specific ones within your establishments that you define and allowed that are acceptable. And of course, the element quality will depend on the element location and the model purpose and the intended response. So mesh quality as well. This is looking at things like, do you have any duplicate elements in your model? Are there any free edges or faces? Perhaps you have some coincident nodes. And you could also be considering quality in the sense of, do you have any excessively small sized elements, which might lead to low time steps in your model or perhaps mass scaling issues? And then finally, perhaps element normals, which are required for specific features. Once you're happy with your mesh definition and element and mesh quality, then it's moving on to performing checks in terms of the actual model definition and setup. So this would be looking at things like the model geometry and structure where you would want to visually check for any interpenetrating parts. These will cause issues with things like your contact behavior. Do you have correct panel gauges and thicknesses? Are there any additional thicknesses set that might interact or affect the contact behavior, perhaps on star part contact? Also, the connections and attachments. Once this thing starts to run, is everything going to remain attached to everything it should? You don't want any parts flying off. Are things going to interact the way that you intend them to do? We know that material properties in your Alice Diner analysis are crucial. So having the correct material types and parameters defined, you'd want to be checking things like, do I have the correct units and are they consistent throughout material types? And that goes beyond just your material definition. Units is obviously a, a check that you should always look for. LS Diner won't know if you have different units set for various material inputs, for example. So that's down to you as the engineer to ensure they're consistent. Also, do we have the appropriate material types for the specific element types that you're using? And then finally, things like the boundary conditions, initial conditions and interactions. So any boundary restraints or symmetry conditions that you have defined. What's the initial velocity in the model? Is it applied to the appropriate parts? And again, is it in the correct units? Is it in the correct vector direction that you're expecting? And finally, contact definitions. Obviously, the contact definition in your model will influence the interactions, the response behavior. You need to make sure that you have the correct surfaces defined. You're using the correct contact types based on the interactions that you want within the between the various parts in your model and also do you have the correct parameters defined for the contact type you're using some specific additional optional options will only be allowed with certain contact types soft equals two for example As part of your pre-analysis checks, you'll likely run an error checker in the pre-processor that you're using if there's one available. And these can be either simple, they might be detailed, or often sometimes they'll be you'll use user-defined checks, so they may be specific to your establishment and in-house targets, for example. And of course, the extent of the detail of the errors and warnings that are reported will vary between pre-processor to pre-processor, and the more you use them, you'll become accustomed to which perhaps are more serious than others and need to be actioned. And then finally, other things like output definitions. Do you have the correct database cards defined that will give you the node and element time histories you require, any energy time histories or perhaps reaction forces and cross section definitions that you want to interrogate? Also, things like if you want to output the contact surfaces so you can visually interrogate that, do you have the correct star database keyword defined?
Okay, so that was a quick overview of some of the pre-analysis checks, but let's demonstrate performing some of these now and looking at some of the tools in action using Oasis Primer. So here I am in Oasis Primer. I've just got a standard vehicle crash model, but it doesn't matter what the model is. The checks I'll discuss today are applicable and should be considered for any model from any industry. And I'm going to start today with the error checker. So this is the checking tool within a preprocessor that will quickly and comprehensively check your LS Dyna model and flag anything that it deems to be an error or a warning. And it's something that I always recommend running on any model before you submit to avoid them falling over when you could have identified it was an issue in the pre-analysis checks. So it will, of course, vary depending upon your preprocessor, but Primer has an extremely comprehensive checking tool building on years of experience of development of the software and it lives under the tools in the top right hand corner of Primer under check. And if I select this it will bring up the check menu and there's several options under this. Some notable ones here are the check categories. This is a list of all of the keywords within the model that LS Dyna will then run through and check. And you could, of course, toggle these on or off depending upon if you wanted to check through all of these or specific ones. And you can also check includes. So if you have an include structure, you can either choose to run through them all or identify and toggle off or on the relevant ones. Today, the default is that they're all active and I'm just going to run through this. So if I click apply, Primer will go through, it will perform the many checks on each of the categories for each of the includes and it will flag anything that it deems an error and anything that it deems a warning. So an error is anything that is serious, shall we say, so something that may prevent it from initialising or could lead to an error termination dur during the simulation. Whereas a warning is less serious, but could be more related to things like poor modelling practices and should still be reviewed. Now, it's not an exact science, so with experience, you'll learn to know which potential errors may be ignored and which ones you need to fix. So under these, I can expand the different categories. Having a look under control, it gives me a little bit more information on what this error is. So it lets me know that the model percentage added mass exceeds my allowable value based on my DT2MS value. And it's letting me know that I need to set this to give a required added mass percentage, so giving the fix. Looking under part, here I can see that there are two different errors. The first one I know from experience isn't going to cause an issue and my model will still initialize and run. But the second one here where we've got something that's referenced but not defined is one that will cause an issue on initialization for LS Dyna. So you can expand these to get a little bit more information. So it's letting me know that this material for this part so is referenced but not defined. What I can do is I can right click over this and I can go to edit. And that will bring up the part, so this part ID. And I can see here that actually the material is in teal blue, which lets me know that although it's defined, it's referenced, sorry, it's not defined. So I could sketch this just to see what that is. And I can see here that it's uh, this right hand panel. So I could either do a drop down fix and create my new material reference and input my material properties. Or if I perhaps think this is just an error and it should actually be a material that's already in the model, I could pick and say, for example, I'll select this to be the same as the rest of the outer body panels. Now, when I update this, you'll see within the error tree, it reperforms the check and that error has now been removed. This error here that I mentioned previously, I know runs without issue. What you can do within the error tree, and it's helpful, is you can promote or demote error and warning messages. So if I right click this and I go to configure error, it brings up the option for me to promote or demote the message. So if it's an error, for example, it will create it to be a warning, or if it was a warning, it'll promote it so that it's an error. And it does this by adding it to something we call the error configuration file. It's on your user area. Uh, you can go in and manually edit this uh, if you wanted to. 
um, and you can also notably use JavaScript to create your own personalized check and add them within this configuration file. So on this one, I'm going to promote and or demote this error because I know that actually it shouldn't be. It's just a warning that I might want to make sure is still remained. And if I recheck, then it's going to run back through all of those error checks, recheck for everything. And once it's completed going through each category and each include, I can now see that I no longer have any part error warnings. But if I expand this here, it's now added the one that I've just demoted into the warning section. Another notable thing that you can do from this panel is you can write all this information to what we call an XML file. And what this does is it stores the information so that you can then refer back to this when you're at a later stage. So if I just exit this check menu, if I come down back to the check options panel in the right hand corner, bottom right hand corner, you can see here I can toggle on what we call reference model. So if, for example, I bought in another model that I would say would be the baseline. So I know it's been fully health checked. It's without any errors or warnings that I deem an issue. And then what I could do is I could read this reference model in and then I could check it against perhaps my updated model to compare the, the errors and messages between the two. Likewise, you could use a reference file and this is in reference to that XML file previously. So if I just open this panel, I can see here I've got one previously with baseline errors. I can open that. It's going to check it against model one because it's the only model I have in here and I can click apply. And what this will do is here is you can see that it's bought up the error tree for the main model. So that's the current one that I have open in this window. And it's highlighted any errors that are different from this in the reference model. So here I could expand it. I can see that within this one, I have two spot weld errors for my reference model. In my current model here, I've only got the one. And so it's a good way to keep always a baseline reference for checking in your model. The second thing to note here from the check panel that's always useful is you have this options menu. And what it will bring up is the check options panel. And this is where you as a user can set all of the checks that Primer will perform and the targets against it. So here we're under the category quality and you can see here I can set element quality checks. If I toggle that on, it's got the Primer default targets, but you as a user could go in and change these. You can save them to your OA prefs and then this will be based every time you re-perform the check on anything that you've defined here. So for perhaps any in-house targets that you may have. Other things here are things like reporting duplicate elements in your model and so on, which aren't necessarily on by default. From this category drop down, there's lots of different check options that you could toggle through and perform and change the different settings under. But one notable one is under the other category. And under this, you can define the actual Dyner version that Primer is going to check your model against. So if, for example, you're running a model in R9, you could toggle this to be Dyna version R9 and what it will do is it will check through each of the keywords to see if perhaps you have something set that's only valid from version R11 or onwards. And it's important to note that in the latest versions of Oasis Primer, the default of this is set to Prime LS Dyna version R11. So another useful check in your pre-analysis checks is a visual check. So the error checker that we've just had a look at can perform checks against what it thinks LS Dyna will deem an error or a warning. But LS Dyna doesn't know what material properties you need in your model or what gauge thicknesses, for example, you're using and you need. So that's down to you when you're setting up your model to check that you have the correct definitions defined. And the quickest way to do that is a visual check. So within Primer, 
in the bottom menu, we have the option to contour plot the, the parts and entities that you have in your model. So it's currently looking at time step, but there are lots of different categories and one that you might want to have a look at are the material properties, for example. So I could switch that to Young's modulus and do a shaded image. And what it will do is it will run through each of the parts and it will color them accordingly for the various different Young modulus values. And it's a quick way for you to have a scan through the model to check that there's nothing untoward or ill-defined. So here I can see the majority of the body in white is defined using steel, for example, and I have the front and rear bumpers with a much lower Young's modulus probably reflecting some plastic. If I'm happy with that, I could check, say, another category. I might have a look at the shell thickness. Again, it will go back through, calculate the gauge of each of the parts and contour them. And at this point, I'd be looking through to see, is there anything that jumps out as me with a value that it perhaps shouldn't? Um, and here I've, I've just spun this under and having a look explicitly underneath, I can see on this tunnel part here, this green part, it's got quite a high value compared to probably about a 0.8 value everywhere else. And I'd expect that to be symmetrical. So that then from a quick inspection might be something I just check. So I could go into part, I could select the left hand and have a quick look at the section. I can see this is a value of 3.5. And likewise, if I wanted to do the same for the left hand panel, check in this one and I see it's got a value of 0.8. So perhaps that's just been mistakenly added as a value of 3.5. And at this point, it's something I might then just update, update the model and update. Now, another important pre-analysis check is to make sure that everything in your model is actually attached. And a way to do that easily within Oasis Primer is to use the attached tool. This will bring up the menu where you have different attached options and different methods for which it will do the search. So under the attached options here, I can see it's searching for and including tied contacts. And I also want to run this recursively. So this means it will loop through a maximum number of recursive loops rather than just looking once and then bringing in only those that are attached. Also, it's looking for the deformable part um, entities by single elements. And a quick way, particularly if you have a very complex large model, such as a vehicle model like this, you'd rather do this by attached part as opposed explicitly to single elements rather than it just pulling in each individual entity. And what I would do to perform this is I'd isolate an individual part. So I'm just going to select and pull in only the roof panel of the car here. So nothing else is included. I've switched it to recursive and I'm searching by part. And I'm going to leave the rest as a default. And I'm going to click apply and then primer is going to loop through and it's going to pull in everything that it feels or is deeming attached, so be that via a tied contact or perhaps a constrained nodal rigid body and so on. Now this just takes a bit of time and when it's finished, you'll see in the dialog box in the bottom left hand corner of primer, it will let you know it's reached the maximum number of loops. It's always useful to just do another quick check. It will run through and see in case there was anything else that needed to it needed more loops through to identify further things attached. So it's telling me here there's no items attached still. So if I just reverse now, I'm expecting that everything that I should be attached to my model will be on this page. But if I reverse the image and have a look, I can see actually here I've now got a component that isn't attached to the, anything in the model. So nothing I do here if I was to reapply will let me know that there is nothing attached. So I'd then want to go back in. I'd want to identify and locate where this might be attached to. 
and then apply this specific constraint to attach it because if I don't, when I run my analysis, if there's an initial velocity applied to everything here, this will just go flying off and impact others items and components within the model that I won't expect it to do. Or perhaps you do expect certain items to not be attached and it's just a good way to check that. So that's a quick one on attached. Now another pre-analysis check that's useful is to just make sure that the mass in your model is as you expected and correct units for example. So what I can do there is in primer, I have a quick option to do a mass properties. I can choose here to select kind of by everything or individual parts and entities, but I just want to do a quick check of my model. So I'm going to select model one and I'm going to have it calculate the mass here. It'll bring up what the mass is. So one and a half tons in this specific model and also the center of gravity. So I could plot the C of G in my model. You can see here it's it's flagged this as a target marker and I just want to be sure for using my judgment that those values seem reasonable and that the C of G is about where I expect it to be. Obviously if I didn't and I ran this perhaps it could be that some units were out or this was excessively high then I might want to edit and modify that. Another mass related thing to be mindful of is any possible added mass that could be inherent in your model based on your time step. So if I used to go to the control keyword option within Primer, there's this calc DT2MS option. And what that will do is it will look through and base on your kind of current time step where it predicts a percentage added mass to be. And what I could here then do is if I think, oh, this is too high a value, I actually only want an allowable value of 5% added mass when this my model is run. But I can go through and calculate what the model time step needs to be in order to achieve that. And I can then set my current DT2MS value based off this so that when it is run, I don't have an unreasonable amount of added mass in my model. Now we'll move on to consider contacts. So contact definitions within your model are often things that can trip up and cause issues when you run within LS Diner. So it's important to do kind of a pre-analysis check in terms of the actual contacts that you have defined. So here this model only has a few simple ones, often in obviously much larger complex models, there might be many more, but it's always worthwhile just identifying which contacts you have, sketch them, do you have the correct parts defined for either the slave or the master side. Also, if you have say tied contacts, which parts are they tying? Does it incorporate the right um, set types and so on. Another thing related to contacts would also be to check for any say initial penetrations or crossed edges. I'm just going to switch to a smaller model here that can demonstrate this on. So underneath contact in this model I've gone to the pen check option and there's only two simple contacts here but I'm going to just have a look at the automatic single surface contact and what Primer does using this check tool is it will look through the model for anything it deems what we call a crossed edge or an initial penetration and it will flag the number and also the severity. You can select each one of these and you can see that it will just identify the offending elements and the various locations. And so within this I might want to understand how severe are they, particularly if they're crossed edges that's something that I want to eliminate in my model and from within primer itself or perhaps your preprocessor, you'll then want to go about fixing these. So either moving the entities apart, adjusting the contact thickness settings and so on. But it's a check that you'll need to perform to ensure that the behavior in the actual analysis will be as expected, particularly for the crossed edges or anything, any other issues like that. And also just in terms of the actual type of contact that you are using.
So one final uh, pre-analysis check that can be quite useful is if perhaps you've made modifications to a model and you want to compare that back to an original one. So an original model but with a baseline that you know runs without issues, then you can use what we call the model modified tool within Primer to check any differences between one and another. So it lives under model, under modified, and here you have the option to select the model that you've modified so in this example, I've got two models loaded. I'm going to have said I've modified model one and I want to compare that to model two. I'm going to output this to a tree view and click apply. And then Primer will look for any differences between all of the keywords in model one and model two. So if I expand some of these, so if I expand sections, I can see that there are different section settings between model one and model two. I could highlight these right click and go to keyword and what primer will do then is it will look it'll bring up the keywords and also highlight the differences between the two so i can see for this section id 100405 in model one so the modified one i have this set to 1.9 whereas in model two so my reference model shall we say it was set to three and it's a good way to just check in case anything has changed that you didn't expect to before you run a model and that's if you do have a baseline one against which to compare it to and i'm saying this is a pre-analysis check but also this could be looped back as a post analysis check if for example you run a model and it behaves completely different to a previous you might want to run it through this what's modified to understand where the differences between them are so it's a good pre or post analysis check OK, so that's a quick look through model checking in terms of pre some of the pre analysis checks, both in terms of types of things that you need to consider. And also we've just taken a quick look at how you might go about checking just a few of those. Obviously, as I've said, this isn't just an exhaustive list. There might be many more in-house checks that you perform, but these are some of the fundamental ones to be considered. Now we're going to move on to model checking actually whilst the analysis is running. So once you're happy, you think you've performed all your pre-analysis checks and you've submitted to the solver, what can you check for whilst it is actually running? There are a couple of things you can check whilst your model is running. You can open the OTF slash D3HSP file and you can see within this if it's got past initialization and is it running. You want to look to see if there's any warnings at the beginning and how serious they are. This might be things like tied contacts that haven't been realized, for example. You can check the time step being used whilst it's running. And also perhaps if your model is implicit, you want to look at the convergence of this. Does it look like it's tending to converge or not? Alternatively, you could also open the PTF slash D3 plot files. This is particularly useful if your model runs over a long period of time, um, perhaps over a few hours. So after the first few cycles, you might want to animate through them just to check that everything is attached. Can you see any contact penetrations? And that helps to avoid waiting until the model has reached termination before you then look through and find out that initially your inputs were wrong and perhaps some things weren't interacting or attached as they should be. OK, so finally, we're going to now move on to some post analysis checks when considering is your model right? And so firstly, one of the things that you can do initially is to check in the OTF slash G3HSP file. So similarly to what I discussed when the analysis is actually running. Once it's reached termination, you want to have a look in this file and see did the initialization stage complete? Was termination time reached? So you can scroll to the end of this file and you're looking for this normal termination to understand if the termination time was reached as expected. And hopefully it was. Obviously, if it wasn't, then you're going to go back in to either your pre-processor, go into debug mode to understand what's been the cause and the issue of that. And we'll have a little look on something similar a little bit later on in this session. 
Are there any errors or warning messages? You can search for error or warning. So that would be if this doesn't normally terminate, you'll be looking for errors in your model. It might give you a clue as to what has happened or what has triggered that error. And then warnings, for example, will tell you things that you should be mindful of in your model. But obviously, LS Diner has hopefully run to full termination. From this value, you might also want to look at the total mass of the model. Is the total mass what you expect it to be based on the inputs? You might want to check which element is controlling the time step. You can search for smallest. It will bring up the 100 smallest time steps and the associated elements, which can be particularly useful if your model is taking quite a long time to run to understand what's controlling that. Is the time step reasonable? And is the final time step used still reasonable? And you can check the added mass so you can look close to the termination time reached, what the ultimate added mass and the percentage increase was, and is that within the acceptable limits for your analysis. So then, of course, one of the fundamental post analysis checks is simply visually reviewing the simulation, loading it into your post processor and animating it through, checking if the behaviour looks realistic, are the kinematics sensible, is everything connected, etc. So I'm just going to jump to D3 part, our post processor for this. So here I've just got the vehicle crash model from earlier. And the first thing I'd be doing is playing it through and just looking at the kinematic behaviour. Is everything interacting as expected? Is everything attached? There's no unexpected parts flying off that aren't supposed to be at a given point in time. How are the components and parts interacting? Um, often, sometimes you might only have a small model, so it's quite simple and obvious to see straight away. In obviously large, complex models, it might take a little bit more interrogation, perhaps change some of the transparency of the parts or isolating individual areas. I'll be looking at contact interaction. Uh, is anything getting caught? Is anything passing through that shouldn't? So in this particular model here, I can see actually there's a component here that seems to be passing through the front bumper and some other components. So what I'd perhaps do then is go back and have a look at actually what this part is, find a little bit more information about what it is, what it belongs to. Um, maybe go back into the preprocessor and have a look at the contact that this is included in. Is it been correctly defined? Is there any additional control measures that I need to add to the contact to ensure that that behavior doesn't happen? I'd also be looking at are the joints holding? Um, how are the connections? So perhaps things like adhesives or any tied contacts that you might have in a model. A good way to sometimes check that is if you were to deform your the model, so I'd go to magnify and I'll pass this up really quite excessively high in this instance. But what you'll notice is when you load the model in, you'll actually be at what we say is state one and that's initialization. So post initialization in LS Diner when the tied contacts or anything else will be realized. But you can also jump back to state zero and that's effectively what you'd have in your preprocessor. So if I toggle through here, I'd be looking for anything that perhaps jumps across something else or looks like it's connecting elsewhere. If I just zoom in on this door panel, for example, and toggle back between state zero and state one, I can see that the spot wells across this plane are connecting as the elements are realized, the contact is realized between the two panels for the spot weld element. If I just switch that back to one. Um, Otherwise, of course, you would also perhaps want to have a look at your data components. So again, this is where your engineering judgment and understanding will come into this. So you could put perhaps some of the categories that you've requested and that are output for your specific model. So here I could just fringe plot the plastic strain. I might play the model through and have a look if I perhaps then wanted to just check this and set this to perhaps a plastic strain value of 0.2 and re, 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 refresh the graphics. I'd be looking, is, is it realistic? Is this where I'd expect uh, specific high levels of um, strain in my model? 
If not, what's driving that? So I'd then perhaps have a look and interrogate what's interacting in that area. What are the material properties that are defined? Do I have the correct ones set? And of course, there's lots more checks that you could do within this in terms of um, visualization uh, and looking at the different categories and defamation modes. Of course, visually checking your model is very useful to look at things like the defamation modes, checking everything is attached, looking at the data component outputs. But it's important to then sanity check your results and the XY data outputs from LS Diner. So initially, I'd be looking at the global energies in the model. So I'll look at the kind of total energy and is it balanced across with all the other contributions from that. So your total energy is a combination of the internal kinetic contact hourglass system and rigid wall energies. Um, particularly looking at the hourglass energy contribution, I'd expect this to be very small in comparison to the overall total energy in your model. If it isn't, it will suggest there's some highly non-physical behaviour in the model that you'd then want to look in at further detail and then address. Also, is the contact energy contribution positive and small? If you have large negative contact energy, it might suggest that there's high amount of initial penetration in your model to which you then want to mitigate and fix that. This is at a global level, but you'd also then want to take that down to a more granular level and look at perhaps local part energies, look at force outputs. So you could locally look at the individual contact behavior between surface A and surface B, uh, expecting them to be equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. Um, look at things like the cross-section force, spring outputs, SPCs. Do they match your expectations? So again, this is when it comes down to having an understanding of the behavior of your model, because at this point in the post-processing checks, it, it will be down to your engineering understanding of are the results realistic. There are obviously some telltale signs, particularly on contact behavior. If you have um, kind of large step changes in the contact energy, that would suggest that parts are perhaps getting caught, perhaps nodes in the different contacts uh, aren't smoothly sliding over each other and they're getting caught up. As I've said, negative energy would suggest large initial penetrations. So things like that would become quite obvious that you'd then have to go back in and isolate where that is in your model. Um, if there's kind of an output that you wanted and you haven't got that as an output or you actually might think so perhaps you're looking at kind of the global contact energy and you want to look down at um, kind of local either reaction contact or down at the nodal level and you haven't requested them out then you'd have to go back into your preprocessor switch the database cards on that are relevant to that and then rerun the model uh, but one useful tip from within THIS, which is our time history uh, application when you're post-processing. If I just switch to that now. So here I've got a linked D3 plot and THIS session. So I've plotted my global energies, but perhaps I want to output my contact results, but I haven't actually requested them previously. So if you haven't and you're not sure which database cards you'd need to flip, switch on to be active then what you can do with from THIS is if you select the drop down and click edit in primer then that will open a linked primer session if I just bring this over and what it will do is it will launch the actual database cards that are relevant and it will highlight those that are associated with the contact outputs so you could then request these to be an output rerun your model and then when you to come back to have a look at your uh, XY data that would now be active for you to plot. So after you've visually checked your model you've had a good look through the XY data hopefully uh, everything would be 
good and as expected because your pre-processing checks would have been so thorough that it all runs as expected to do but that's not always the case so it may be the fact that perhaps something uh, the kinematics are slightly out uh, you're getting an unusual behavior perhaps in some contact energy or some additional hourglass energy for specific parts so then you might have to go into kind of a debugging mode and running some checks in order to debug your model. So things like this that I would be thinking about is, do I have enough data points in my model? If not, I might need to increase the rate of output so I can fully isolate perhaps where the issue is occurring. Do I need some additional database output? So do I have enough data, particularly in the XY data outputs, that means that I can fully understand the full picture of what's happening? I might go back in and have a look at some magnified deformation in the model, try and understand where components might be either misbehaving. I would go back through perhaps some of the pre-processing checks. So if I could isolate an issue, perhaps I missed on my first checks round by having a look at the model in the pre-processor again. I'd also be thinking about if the model had run previously and if it had, then what's changed, what's different between the previous version and this. So obviously earlier I touched on that model modified and that would be a useful check at that stage that I would then go back in and see to understand where the differences lie between the two models. Uh, but mostly a lot of the information that I would be looking to get might come from the OTF slash D3HSP files and the message files that are written by LS9 automatically upon completion of the model. Um, as it's running because in there that's where you get all the information on those warnings and errors so we said these are things that you can have a look at whilst the analysis is also running um, but sometimes either your model might run very quickly or you wait until the next day and have, come back have a look and see these files and this is often where I would go to first just to check um, on my post-processing checks what is in there but these files can be quite hefty uh, they contain a lot of information and depending upon the number of cores that you run the, your model on will might mean that you have numerous numbers of messages files as you'll have one per core that you submit your model on so sifting through that is not always easy but there are actually options to help you with that so i'm just going to go to primer now, Primer is, of course, a preprocessor, but it can be also used as part of your post-processing checks. And that's because under the check tool that we had a look at earlier, there's also this LSDyne check option. And what this does is this will search through your kind of results folder, or you can choose a directory of your choice. And it will look for all of the files that LSDyne writes out as an output in terms of errors and warnings, the contact profile, load profile, and message profiles. And it will let you know when it's found them, it will highlight them and they'll be ticked and active if they are. If not, you could navigate to a folder where your results are already. And I could click apply. And what that will do is it will search through each one of the message files and also the OTF and it will load them in in a similar capacity to the error and warnings tree that we looked at earlier for the pre-submission checks. So in this one I can see that there are no errors in this model, uh, no unusual termination, but there are 14 warnings here and these are the different warning codes that were relevant in the actual files that it's read. So what you can do is you can expand these and it will give you a little bit more information on what they are. So here this is telling me I have a massless node. I can go to edit and I can have a look at what that node is. So I can actually interrogate further my model from the errors and warnings that LS Diner has printed within Primer. So I could sketch this to try and see what that node is. I might then want to delete it if it had caused any issues. Obviously the models run fine, but it can help me understand where the warnings are coming from in my model. You can also change how you view this. So you can have a look at it via an item mode or error mode. So error is explicitly what's printed within the LS Diner output, whereas an item mode might help you to break it down into those kind of categories that we saw earlier. So here it's letting me know there's challenges with these shells. So it's letting it know it 
violates this heuristic shape criterion. And it's a quick way for you to extract all that information that you otherwise would have had to go through each and every single message file in your output deck. Also, it will print the smallest time steps so you could here see which of those are driving your time step criterion. So I could sketch that specific solid there. I could isolate where that is in my model if I zoom in. So it looks like it's driven by this spot weld element within this local part. And if my model was taking a particularly long time to run, then I might go in and uh, investigate that further. Now, one other thing that you can consider in terms of quality in a post-processing aspect is actually how long did it take to run? What was the efficiency of your model? Obviously, as models get ever more large and complex, they can sometimes take a significant length of time until they reach termination, particularly dependent upon the number of cores that you run your model on. So it's sometimes useful to understand what is LS Dyna doing in the background? How is it processing your model? And where is it spending the most amount of time in its processing, i.e., is it spending a large amount of time in the contact processing? Is it spending a long, large amount of time in terms of elements? And this information can then be useful because it can help you understand, can I make my model more efficient in terms of runtime? Particularly if you start to look at decomposition. Now that information generally lives in the OTF file. So the OTF and message files, sorry. So at the end of each of those files, you'll have a little bit of inf timing information on each of the activities, shall we say, that LS Diner is performing and how much time it takes, percentage time across each core to do each of those. So obviously if you have a lot of cores, that's quite difficult to discern and make much information out of that. So in Primer, so in the session where we've just had and we were having a look in that check output, what it will also do is it will also read in these load profile, contact profile and message profile information. And what that will do is it will bring in all of that time and information so that you can understand what has been performed on each call. So here I can see this model was run on 16 CPU. And you can see the time it's taking to process each of the entities here. If I switch to contact, for example, this model only has one, so it's quite a simple output. We can have a look at one in a moment that took a bit longer. But this breaks down how much time was spent or on each CPU, shall we say, in performing the contact, um, the contacts, in processing the contacts. And finally, in the message profile, so this is that information that you just saw at the end of the OTF. So how much time it took in keyword processing, the length of time it performed on contact algorithm for each message, each CPU. And what we're looking for here is we're looking for a balance across them all. So if for some ex reason your model is taking a particularly long amount of time, you might be looking to see, well, is all of the contact algorithms being performed on only a few cores and all of the element processing being performed on another. In reality, what we'd like to see is something similar to this. So a nice balance across them all without a bottleneck. But sometimes it is the case that you will see that. And this is useful information to understand what is happening. In terms of decomposition also, so how your model is decomposed across the cores that you submit your analysis on. If you're running an MPP, there are specific star control MPP cards that you can flag on in your model. And if you've done this, then you can actually request to visualize how your model is being decomposed. When you do this, it will produce a decomp underscore SES file and Primer can read that file in, so under decomposition, and you can then colour the elements of your model accordingly. Because what this file does is it stores information on which elements are being processed on which core and you can have a breakdown to see how that is actually in reality. 
And where this becomes useful is perhaps you have, um, say, a dummy and your restraints and your airbag, and they're all particularly being run on one CPU. That might help you understand why there is perhaps a bottleneck in terms of processing on one specific core. And where it also becomes useful is the star control MPP cards can be used to help improve the efficiency of your model, so perhaps the runtime. And depending upon how you choose to decompose that will vary. And it helps when you want to visualize. So in this alternative model here, for example, now this model has been run on many more cores. So I can see here it's been run on 64 and you can see the all the information and the load profile here across them all. And you can imagine having to filter through 64 message files uh, would necessarily be an easy challenge. But this model has had a specific decomposition applied to it. And now if I go to colour these elements, I could see how explicitly that has been decomposed across the 64 cores to which it's run. So if you are using any of the MPP control options, then it's particularly useful to use this check decomposition to view those within the preprocessor to help with anything in terms of your post-processing options also. Okay, so that was just finishing up a little bit on efficiency in terms of your post analysis checks and brings us to the end of the post checks section. So we've had a look at things like checking the OTF slash D3HSP file and the message files and some of the information in that that's useful to extract and understand. And also that link to how you can use Primer to review that data outputs after it's terminated and it can succinctly and quickly extract all that data for you. Also considered visual checking your model, so looking at the kinematics, understanding if everything is attached and interacting as you expect, is the behaviour reasonable, looking at some of the data components. Also interrogating the database outputs, so having a look at the global energies, then perhaps down at local part level energies, considering things like your contact outputs in terms of energies, forces, section forces, SPC outputs, and so on. We touched briefly on some debugging checks and tips and things that you might want to consider if for some specific reason your model perhaps isn't behaving as expected or you've got some error termination. And then we've just rounded up with the efficiency and decomposition. OK, well, that pretty much brings me to the end of today's session. And I just wanted to finish up with some final checking tips that run alongside the checks we've already considered today in terms of getting your model right. And this, these cover a little bit more in terms of the processes. So it's particularly useful to set in-house targets and have user-defined checks and for these to be centrally managed, especially if you have a large team with many people working across a specific model. It can avoid differences in checks and also then mean that there's consistency in the models that you're submitting and also the results that you're getting out. Version control is useful. Uh, in terms of if something changes in your model, particularly it's useful to have a baseline model where you've run a check, you know it's completely healthy, shall we say, and free of errors or warnings. You could write out that error and warning check as we saw earlier in Primer and refer back to that. And also then you can use that to check and find what's modified perhaps between a later version to understand what changed if the later version has any issues. You should always define a kind of checking list, shall we say, so a process to which you follow for your, both your pre and post checks. Again, this will ensure consistency in the models and in the results that you're getting so that if many people are working within a team, they're all following the same process before submitting and running the model. And along that line, you can look at automating all of this. So you can automate the pre-submission checking. There's a dashboard option available in Primer that we haven't gone into detail today in the interest of time. But you could use this to run each time before you run and it will explicitly output the model health, shall we say, based on the checks that it performs. And also 
you can automate the post processing. So you could set up a reporter template that would run through and check the key metrics, maybe write out things like the mass, the added mass, time step, runtime, warnings, errors, etc. in a unified batch process, which means that at the end of, say, a termination, everybody gets a specific output and you can understand if the model that you've submitted is right and as expected. Today we've covered some of the checks through each step of the workflow. So your pre-submission checks whilst your model's running, and then your post-analysis checks in terms of getting consistency from your model, consistency in results, and generally getting your model right. Obviously, we've only got a short space of time today, so that which we've covered isn't exhaustive in terms of all the checks that you can consider. You may have many more additional ones in-house that you perform, but just wanted to cover some of the fundamentals to consider each time you run through both pre and post submission. So thanks all for joining. Uh, I'm available online now if there are any questions and anything that we've covered, you can drop them into the chat on the side and I'll be happy to answer them. And if not, I wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you for listening.